So often I will ask people, do you want to live an exceptional life? Yeah. And most people will say yes. But an exception by definition is low probability. And if, if you want to live a normative life, you'll be in the middle of the bell curve. But if you want an exceptional life, it's going to be low probability. So one of the questions you want to ask yourself, every, anyone who wants an amazing life is probably going to go for a low probability life, which means you have to activate some sense of possibility. So when you ask yourself, what is the possibility of, of doing something, in that situation you would say, rather than saying, how do I recover from this trauma or how do I recover from this grief, what you say is, what do people who recover from these situations amazingly do? And so there, what you're looking for is the exception, right? You're basically saying, I want to know what the exception does. Like most people go through these situations, they have a pretty hard time, and they sort of get through. But what about that person who is actually able to do this and do this amazingly? So the very first principle is think like the exception and not like the rule. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. As the world's largest network of remote professionals, we're here to help. Upwork is giving $1 million in talent grants to projects that counter the ongoing impacts of COVID-19 by connecting existing teams with independent experts in tech, creative, and operations to help save lives, to support communities, and rebuild the economy. Go to upwork.com slash work together to learn more. Srini, welcome to The Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks so much for having me. I, I always love talking to you. Yeah, well, so, you know, it's funny because um, we actually have you back. And it's very rare that we will put, you know, somebody who we've just had recently within the last few months back so soon. But I had a chance to read your book. And right after reading your book, I thought, yeah, this is a no brainer. There's so much here um, for us to talk about. Before we get into, um, you know, the ideas in the book, uh, I want to ask, what was the very first job that you ever have? What did you learn from it? And what impact has that had on your life going forward? I'm trying to think. I, I think I actually worked at a family store um, selling fireworks um, during a Diwali celebration. So I had an uncle who got all the cousins together to try to gather stuff uh, to give to people who were at the counter. So I remember at the time sort of looking at the cash register, which was a kind of manual cash register. And there was something about the sound of it that sounded so awesome. Uh -huh. um, and I think just the whole idea of the transaction was sort of fascinating to me because you could be nice to people. They were happy because you were giving them something that they wanted. And then they gave you money in exchange for that. I think I don't think I had that profound a thought at the time. Sure. But I did think at the time... You know, it was sort of weird as a child. Every time I did anything, I actually thought I wanted to do it. Like, I thought I wanted to be an infant class teacher when I was at that stage. And at that point, I was like, wow, this would be really great to be a shopkeeper. It would be, like, really amazing. Uh -huh. People come, they get really happy. So I think one of the things, in retrospect, as you ask me this, is that I think to the extent that you can get engaged in something, you can really enjoy it maximally. Mm -hmm. You know, so I know so many parents who have kids who are telling them things like, oh, I want to be this. You know, I, I have a cousin who has told his uh, our nephew who's, who's told his mother that he wants to be in the military. And to look at him I'm like this guy can't be in the military. He's scrawny as hell. I'm just curious, you know, when parents are dealing with kids who are saying, you know, that they want to be these things, things that seem, you know, really out there. What would you say to them? I think I would say that it's important to explore that because yeah. I think whether or not they are capable of doing that. Why not try to understand what's underneath that? And what, when you explore that, when you explore that, you might actually come to some kind of understanding about what's fueling that. So, for example, if somebody wanted to be in the military and they were really not physically disposed to being in the military, you know, they might be able to be in the military as a doctor, uh -huh. or they might be able to make military movies. You know, there's a school that I particularly love um, called Brightworks, which is in San Francisco. Um, that that actually has this kind of education where they they choose themes like nails and one person will make a chair and the other person will write a screenplay 
about nails. So, you know, the whole idea of, of tinkering around with an idea is something that's close to my heart. And so I feel like the first response is, let's explore this. Let's see what's in this, what's making you want to do that. Yeah. You know, I, I remember the Brightworks part very distinctly because, you know, I, I've always had questions about education, especially for people who, uh, you know, work within our education system or people like you. Uh, so, so I'm curious, you know, why do you think it is that we have not made uh, the changes and the transitions in our education system for sort of the world that we're headed to and, and this world in which we tinker? Because, you know, it, it seems like it, it, we're, we're, we're still living by this very standardized model of, you know, memorize information and regurgitate it on tests in order to get good grades. Yeah, I, I think in part because there's something about that whole system that seems like it's very exploratory. Mm-hmm. And I think exploration creates some sense of uncertainty. And I think uncertainty makes the brain sort of feel like there's going to be doom and gloom. Like 75% of people mispredict when bad things are going to happen under uncertain conditions. So I think to a large extent, uncertainty keeps us from that. But I also think part of the reason we haven't really explored education differently is that we're caught up in these old models. And even though our brain is wired for change, the brain doesn't really like to change. Mm -hmm. And so I think to a large extent, this is also about resistance to change and not wanting to be in this unfamiliar space, which I think is really too bad because whether you like it or not, the world is becoming increasingly unfamiliar as things begin to change, as artificial intelligence begins to to move into the workplace, as technology basically starts to transform our work environment. So my feeling is that the people who will win are the people who are most adaptive and learning the competencies related to adaptation is really where it's at. Mm-hmm. You know, so this feeling of uncertainty, you know, I, I I know that I wrestle with it on a daily basis as somebody who's a business owner and entrepreneur. Like I know there are some months that are good. Sometimes I don't know if a month is going to be bad. Um, I'm curious how a person uh, nav- adjusts to being able to navigate life with uncertainty. Are there things that we can do so that our brain doesn't go into this sort of freak out mode when we when we encounter uncertainty? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think there are a couple things you can do. The first thing is you can actually set particular times or particular things in your life that are not uncertain. So to a large extent, for certain people who have entrepreneurial lives, the stability in their relationships provides the certainty that they want. Or for other people, relationships may be just complete hell. And so for them, just going to the gym, you know, X times a week, may be the certainty that they want. So I think the first thing would be set aside a certain amount of time for that certainty. I think the second thing is since you know that the brain is biased and that 75% of the time the brain is actually going to tell you that something bad something bad is going to happen when in fact all it means is you don't know, learning to use self-talk to reframe that. Mm-hmm. The moment you start to have this freak out, if you say, okay, I know my brain is in biased mode and that's because the conflict detector and the disgust center and the gut feeling detector – are all activated. And if you just say to yourself, well, okay, I'm just going to go back into neutral, which is uncertainty means I don't know. It doesn't mean something bad is going to happen. I think that kind of self-talk can really help. Mm -hmm. But I think the third piece just try to consider is what is this going with the flow idea? And to what extent can going with the flow serve me? And, you know, it relates to the first question you asked about the child and the parent. And what do you say to a child who wants to do something? One of the big things uh, that I think is important is what I call possibility thinking. Mm -hmm. And possibility thinking essentially means that rather than telling your brain that something is just not possible because you're limited, you ask yourself, how can I make this possible? And when you believe in something, this actually can increase opioids in the brain. So it causes you to be in a more relaxed state. It can increase dopamine, so you feel more motivated, and it activates the reward system in the brain, which actually makes you feel more rewarded. So there was a study that was done that actually looked at, um, they gave people three tubes of um, cream, and I'm not sure if I talked to you about this particular study before. but I don't think so. It, the, the, the one tube was, was essentially labeled lidocaine, uh, the other one was labeled capsaicin, and the third one was just labeled neutral. 
And the reality was that it was the same neutral cream in all three tubes. So when people saw lidocaine, which is for pain relief, they were like, wow, this feels really great. When they saw capsaicin, which is the active ingredient in chili, they were like, wow, this really stings. And when they saw neutral, they actually said, you know, this feels like nothing. And, and, and so it was, it was, the first thing was that it was remarkable that just by seeing a label, your brain can believe something. Mm -hmm. But the second thing was that when you believed it was going to cause pain relief, when you saw lidocaine, it actually activated the centers in your brain that are the reward pathways. And when you believed it was going to cause pain, which is the capsaicin tube, it activated some of the anxiety pathways, indicating that our beliefs can change brain activation and can thereby change the motivation. And as a result of that, I think possibility thinking is something that can inform you in all states of uncertainty because you can use a kind of detective modality, which is like, yeah, sure, I don't know what's happening, but the next step is exciting because I'm just waiting to figure out what's going to happen so my brain can have more data. Mm -hmm. So those three things, I think, firstly, just really trying to have a sense of possibility thinking, I think trying to correct to neutral, and then I think also having some level of acceptance or, or surrender to that uncertainty is important. Mm. So, uh, you know, I get the sense just from uh, hearing this, that this notion of possibility thinking is something that is habitual. And the more you do it, the better that you get at it. Uh, so in the midst of a situation that is incredibly traumatic or, you know, at the moment seems like it's going to just overload you with grief, like a breakup or the death of a parent or, or something like losing a job. Um, how do you how do you maintain possibility thinking in those scenarios? So uh, there's a general principle. So often I will ask people, do you want to live an exceptional life? Yeah. And most people will say yes. But an exception by definition is low probability. And if, if you want to live a normative life, you'll be in the middle of the bell curve. But if you want an exceptional life, it's going to be low probability. So one of the questions you want to ask yourself, every, anyone who wants an amazing life is probably going to go for a low probability life, which means you have to activate some sense of possibility. So when you ask yourself, what is the possibility of, of doing something in that situation, you would say, rather than saying, how do I recover from this trauma or how do I recover from this grief? What you say is, what do people who recover from these situations amazingly do? And so there, what you're looking for is the exception, right? You're basically saying, I want to know what the exception does. Like most people go through these situations, they have a pretty hard time and they sort of get through. But what about that person who is actually able to do this and do this amazingly? So the very first principle is think like the exception and not like the rule. The second thing I'll say, which a lot of people don't realize, is that under situations that are difficult, so where there's a loss or something traumatic, we tend to want to vent. But by and large, most of the research actually shows that if you debrief after a situation, if you go over the situation, you discuss the trauma, and you, and you talk about it over and over again, you may think that you are being relieved, but in reality, you are cementing that thought into your brain. And so debriefing or going over that trauma over and over again is not helpful. Rather, what is really helpful is focusing on your resilience. What makes me a survivor? What will make me feel stronger? When I do recover from this, how will I move forward? And the one thing I would say is, I, I think a lot of people feel they've, that they've got to do this in a cheerleading kind of way. And I'm not really in favor of that at all. I think that it's normal to be grieving when something, like it would be absolutely absurd if you actually you know, started getting happy when something negative happened. Like I'm, I'm literally thinking about an experience I had at an airline counter recently where they mistakenly canceled my flight. And I was angry and upset. And I said, look, you know, are you going to do anything about this? And the person was like, you know, you don't have to be angry. I said, well, what do you think would be a more normal response? To be happy? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he, and he looked at me and he looked at me sort of surprised. I said, well, it's just, you know, somehow you live in the sterilized world where you feel like all anger is bad or inappropriate. But I would think you would think I was insane if I was like, well, I'm so happy you canceled my flight. Thank you so much. Like, so I feel like to a certain extent, if there's a trauma, accept the fact that you're going to go through a phase, touch base with yourself. You know, obviously, if at some point there's an extreme depression or anxiety, mm -hmm. you're going to have to address that. But the, the two basic principles are, you know, really try to, when you are in that traumatic situation, uh, not debrief and focus on your resilience. Mm. 
So we know a lot of you have been listening to us for years, and it means the world to us. What we do here at The Unmistakable Creative wouldn't be possible without the support of our listeners. If the podcast has been valuable to you, one of the best ways you can support us is to subscribe to Unmistakable Creative Prime, which gives you access to transcripts, all of our courses, monthly coaching calls, live chats with our guests, and an incredible community of creatives. And it costs less than you spend on a cup of coffee every month. For the school teachers and people in our education system, Prime is completely free to help you with this transition to teaching online. We've packed it with a ton of value and actionable content, and we hope you'll check it out. Just go to unmistakablecreative.com slash prime to learn more. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash prime. So you, you brought up depression and anxiety, and I had to ask, um, you know, given that you're a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist, what has your research shown about depression and anxiety and more importantly, pulling out of it? Well, you know, I think depression and anxiety depends a little bit on the extent of the depression and, and what's causing the depression. So I would say, by and large, there are biological causes, there are psychological causes and social causes. So there are actual illnesses, things, certain tumors, certain thyroid diseases, certain heart conditions that can lead to all of these things. So whenever anybody comes to me with any of those things, I first make sure that they have a proper medical examination to exclude any of those medical things that are easily treatable. And once those things are excluded, then you go on to thinking about psychological sort of ideas around this. And I think my philosophy around this is, is you know, over the years has grown to where, where I used to direct the anxiety disorder center at McLean Hospital at Harvard. And I started out feeling like, you know, really empowered about the fact that I could treat anxiety because I was like, wow, this is really cool. All I have to do is use a benzo and an SSRI and people's anxiety goes away. You know, I feel good. They feel everybody feels good. But I realized after a while that there were certain situations in which I was medicating out the transcendence, that certain kinds of anxiety, certain kinds of stress can actually be helpful. We call this U stress and which is EU stress. And so when when there's U stress rather than distress, you want to encourage it. And so over time, I recognized that none of these things, depression or anxiety, are all good or all bad. You really have to look at the context in which they're occurring, and you have to look at what they're doing for the person. So in an entrepreneur, for example, an entrepreneur was like, you know, I'm totally calm every day. I don't think about it. It would make me wonder, like, what kind of risks you know, is this person taking? And, and, and to what extent can this anxiety, can we channel this anxiety so that they increase their strategic speed? You know, a little bit like a tailwind. Mm. Uh, so I, I wouldn't want to completely remove that. But I think when depression or anxiety cause sort of huge obstacles in social functioning, in occupational functioning at work, that's when you want to start to sort of figure that out and, and give people choices that range all the way from medications to cognitive therapy and also to you know, psychodynamic therapy. And there are lots of, of, sort of alternative uh, ways of, of managing those, those uh, conditions as well. Yeah. Well, let's do this. Let's get into um, the ideas uh, into the book. You know, it, one of the things that really struck me was this notion of, of the subtitle, Unlock the Power of the Unfocused Mind. And, you know, that struck me as really odd, given that I'm writing a book about creative habits, talking a lot about focus and flow. And, you know, we've spent a great deal of time in the modern world writing up life hacks, productivity hacks, and building all sorts of tools to, you know, avoid distraction. Um, so, you know, what, what prompted this notion of unlocking the power of the unfocused mind? Well, you know, I, for a lot of people who I've seen in my practice, uh, what I see is that there are a ton of people, both in my, in my corporate work and with people who, are, who I've been seeing for a long time as patients, they, they have goals. And, and just because you write out a goal and you have a strategy doesn't actually guarantee that you're going to get to that goal. And so it started to occur to me that we were oversimplifying something about the way in which the brain worked. And the more I learned about the brain, the more I recognized that both focus and unfocus work together in the brain to get people to their goals. Now, people may say, well, what exactly do you mean by that? And just to answer your question literally, uh, the reason I wanted to write this book was because I sat down with my agent who said, I want you to talk for one hour nonstop, and I want to see what you're thinking about. And then we can figure out what the topic of your book should be. And I was like, well, you know, I did a lot of things. I trained as a doctor, as a brain scientist. I'm a musician. I also work in biotechnology. I'm now starting a technology arm of the company. And all of this is working and it's happening. And she said, well, it sounds like this stuff is working for you. And to most people, it would sound overwhelming, but you seem to just be going with the flow or taking it in your stride. And I said, yeah, I am. She said, well, why don't you start writing about this so you can help people? Because 
it sounds like most people do have a lot of diverse interests, but they're intimidated by their own complexity. And it was that particular idea that I feel that most human beings are compromising their lives by oversimplifying their lives, and that by denying their complexity, they're not able to tap into the richest parts of their beings. That's actually what prompted me to want to write that book. And just to make the med- to make that a little simpler, I believe strategies are absolutely important. Like I believe that in order to complete something, you do need a strategy. But the strategy is more like a plant, and that that plant has to have its roots in something so that it can grow. And in the brain, what we know is that somewhere between 90 and 98% of mental activity is unconscious. So if there's that much unconscious activity, and we know that at rest, 20% of the energy of, of, of the body is being used by this kind of almost silent part of the brain, by the unconscious shuttling around memories and shuttling, making new associations, shouldn't we learn how to hone that part of the brain, because it's so much of the brain, so that the soil in which those, those plants of strategy grow is, are, is actually strong enough to be able to hold those roots. So when there are blocks in the unconscious, it's a little bit like stopping the roots of your strategy from spreading. Or if, there are, if there's a shaking of that soil, then your strategy becomes shaky. And I can tell you, every business person I've talked to who's managed to scale their company, to either sell it to Google or to, you know, to do something so amazing and large with it, always talks about the fact that, that the real work that was done was not in the strategy and in the articulation of what the steps were, but in going to the very basis and the origins of why am I running this business, who, who am I as a person, and how can I stabilize who I am so that the strategy can come from somewhere much deeper. And so in the book, I talk about the fact that there are people who prototypically, you know, people like Steve Jobs or or like Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg, who at transition points in their lives took time off in order to wander and in order to connect with these deeper parts of themselves and then came back to the world with a strategy that seemed to have worked out. And when you engage your unfocused mind, you are essentially giving your brain permission to become much smarter so that it can make, so that it has the time and space to make associations that are new associations from which your strategy can grow. So while I think the focused mind is essential for strategy, I think that the, un, that the unfocused mind is essential for the substrate in which that strategy is placed. Wow. Okay. So many questions come from this. Um, you know, so you mentioned the Steve Jobs and, and Mark Zuckerberg thing, and I, I knew about you know the taking time away. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, why is it? You know, this is also for very personal reasons. Why is it that, for example, I get some of my best ideas and my best insights from my time surfing at, in the ocean, um, or why is it in particular that we seem to draw these kinds of breakthrough ideas when we're in nature? Yeah, so, so here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a, I think, a nice metaphor. I think that the breakthrough ideas are essentially new ideas and original ideas that come from a unique and novel recombination of material in your brain. So when your brain is simply focused, then metaphorically, you have a fork, and the fork is picking up all the solid pieces of your identity. But when your brain is unfocused or in, in some kind of flow state, the default mode network, the DMN, or if you can't remember this, so think of it as the do mostly nothing network, invites a bunch of other silverware to the table. So all of a sudden you have a spoon that can pick up this delicious melange of flavors of your identity. You know, things like the smell of apple pie in the fall or the scent of your grandmother when you leaned over to kiss her. These are very important parts of identity that, that, can, that can actually be scooped up by this uh, metaphoric spoon element. And then there are chopsticks, which basically connect ideas across the brain. So all of a sudden, in this unfocused state, you have a whole new set of silverware. In addition to the spoon, you have these chopsticks. And then, depending on your diet, you have this marrow spoon or, or melon spoon that goes into all the nooks and crannies in your brain and picks up all these puzzle pieces and fragments that come together. So all of a sudden, your identity goes from being fork based to being based on to, to being based on having a fork, a spoon, chopsticks, and a marrow spoon, all of which then create a much more complex picture of who you are 
and bring puzzle pieces to the fore that ordinary focus could not bring. So it's really the fact that this brain circuit does much harder work when, you're, when you are in an unfocused state that, that makes us want to do that. And in fact, I was just thinking about this today and I was thinking about how people often, when they think about science, think about science as a very rational and sequential and logical process. And of course, there's a huge part of science that is that way. But many, many thinkers, uh, you know, like Kuhn, the philosopher, for example, would say that, that actually si- the, the real revolutions in science w- came from very unfocused moments where people made these, these sudden connections and realizations, and so amazing things were discovered. And there are a ton of examples, you know, all the way from Velcro to Viagra, where, where people stumbled, up, some stumbled across an idea because they made connections. And so I think that, that, that in general, when you are in a state that is promoting this unfocused brain circuit, you are stimulating a very different kind of intelligence that can allow you to be focused in a very different way. Mm. So a couple of questions come from this. One, what is the difference between being unfocused and being distracted? Because I think there's a very big difference between my time in the water being unfocused and my time being distracted, twiddling with you know every app on my smartphone. The other thing is, knowing this, why do we still have an eight-hour workday that you know requires so many people to be in an office sitting in front of a computer? Yes, absolutely. So firstly, I think that unfocused is a bit of a produ- uh, provocative term because I think the first thing people think about is distraction. And mm-hmm. of course, I'm not prescribing distraction. I think distraction is annoying. And to a large extent, it's about getting caught up in some other kind of calming habit like scrolling through your email um, or, or not working on the task at hand. So distraction is clearly not helpful. Um, I think that 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 in terms of so you know why we don't why we have these eight hour workdays? I mean, I think that's a great question. I actually created together with this book an app which I call the Tinker Table, which is a right now it's a desktop app, but it basically automatically blocks off your day with ten to fifteen minute intervals for as long as you wanted to, as many times as you wanted to. Because I really think that when you look at the lifestyles of productive and creative people, this kind of this kind of this kind of sort of breakthrough thinking requires these frequent breaks that are built into a day. And to your point about distraction, let's take one particular kind of distraction experience, like daydreaming. Right, the moment you say daydreaming, people are like, "Oh my God, I hate daydreaming." And suddenly, Matthew Killingsworth and colleagues actually looked at daydreaming and found that if you just slip into a daydream, you become really depressed and you become sort of you know you, you become unsettled. And so slipping into a daydream is a bit like falling off a cliff. It's not that helpful. But if, however, and, and also guilty ruminative daydream, you know, daydream going to a party and maybe having a bit too much to drink and then <laughs> the next day being like, oh, my God, I was so disinhibited. What did I actually do? That kind of guilty stuff is not that helpful. But what is helpful is what we call positive constructive daydreaming, which was studied by Jerome Singer and his colleagues in the 1950s. And, and since then, there have been a lot of different studies that have shown that positive constructive daydreaming can be really helpful. Now, one of the ways, uh, there are a couple of ways in which positive constructive daydreaming differs from just slipping into a daydream. And I would say the best way to do it uh, is, is the metaphor that describes the difference is that slipping into a daydream is like falling off a cliff. Whereas when you plan your daydream, it's like skydiving or putting on a parachute. So the first thing you do, uh, and this, this a lot of research has shown, is that you should have some kind of playful, volitional imagery. So think of yourself, something that really makes you feel playful and relaxed. So lying on a yacht or running through a park or you know, just anything that makes you cooking, like whatever you want to imagine that makes you feel so sort of relaxed. The second thing is what they call perceptual decoupling, which is that we spend most of our days, most of our waking hours are spent with our sense organs engaging the world as if the only way of collecting information is by looking is by collecting information with our perceptions. But the truth is perceptions, touch and vision and hearing are all prone to a tremendous number of illusions and they have definitive limits. And it is really inward travel that can allow you to develop a completely different kind of experience. So the way you do that, close your eyes. And you close your eyes for just 30 seconds so that you take the flashlight of attention, instead of pointing it outwards, you point it inwards. 
And then open your eyes again because studies show that this positive constructive daydreaming is best done when you are doing an undemanding activity, not nothing and not a hugely demanding activity. So something like knitting or something like gardening can actually help facilitate these daydreams. So start with the imagery, close your eyes, turn your attention inward, and then open your eyes again and do something undemanding. And that form of daydreaming can actually increase creativity. And what it does when you withdraw your perception from the environment is that it actually also allows you to, 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 to cycle attention. So it's like re-energizing your brain because you're giving the focus circuits time to rest. And most people, when they go through their days, their usual pattern is focus, 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 fatigue, going to bed, I'm done. And I think what people don't realize is that if you take care of your brain in a different way, if you do focus and then some little piece of unfocused activity, you know, maybe you could go for a walk, maybe you could do, use uh, possibility thinking, maybe you could use positive constructive daydreaming. You come back, you do some focused activity, and then you take a lunch break. And after your lunch break, you feel a little tired. So you try something else. You maybe take a 10-minute nap for clarity or a 90-minute nap for creativity. And all of a sudden, your whole day, you're giving yourself a chance to work with a brain that is much more energized. Otherwise, your energy goes from high to low, and you're still forcing your brain, by the time you get to mid-afternoon, and you're really in a slump, you're still forcing this tired brain to work with something. Why not energize it in between so that the entire day you're working with an optimally energized brain? Mm. Hey, it's Ben. And it's Ronnie. And we're from Watch What Crappens. And this is a Staycast from Acast. Guys, stay home, okay? That's the advice from the government, okay? It's not like there's nothing to do. There's plenty of TV to watch and make fun of. And there's plenty of podcasts to listen to, like us. Yeah. Or you can also listen to some of our friends like Danny Pellegrino with Everything Iconic or Lara Shanehalls with Sex Unique Podcast. Or 90 Day Gays with the Sissy Squad, okay? Check out our friends while you're taking this break. We love them. They love you. That way we're all kind of cuddling together in our places, okay? Stay safe, guys. When I first started The Unmistakable Creative, I spent a lot of time emailing potential podcast guests just to get their interview scheduled. As you might imagine, this was really inefficient, and it led to a lot of back-and-forth email. Fortunately, thanks to Acuity Scheduling, it doesn't have to be this way for you. Clients can quickly view your real-time availability and self-book their own appointments and even reschedule with a click and pay online. You can collect everything you need to know about a client as soon as they book by asking clients to fill out customizable intake forms from scheduling, keeping all of their information neat and tidy in one place. Acuity actually helps prompt your clients with texts and email reminders, dramatically reducing no call, no shows by accepting deposits or full up front payments. So you can use it for clients, you can use it for podcast guests, or any other kind of meeting in which you're having to send a lot of back and forth email just to get a meeting scheduled. So save yourself from the day-to-day drudgery of having to keep up with your clients and your busy schedule by using Acuity Scheduling. And for a limited time only, you can get 45 days of Acuity Scheduling absolutely free with no credit card required by going to acuityscheduling.com slash creative. Again, that's acuityscheduling.com slash creative. You know, it's interesting because I just published an article on Medium about how I managed to produce what I do despite having a, an incredibly short attention span. And a good amount of it was the fact that I've optimized the days based on what times of day I know my attention span is at its peak. Because for me, not all hours of the day are created equal. And I think not, you know, probably consciously, uh, you know, being aware of it, I've, I've done many of the things that you are talking about, which has allowed me right. to actually do all the things that I do. That makes total sense to me because I, I think if you're in touch with that, then you know, you know, after lunch, I'm not going to be productive, so I'm not going to do that. Or at three o'clock, I'm going to feel like I need a cup of coffee. And actually, studies show that in many instances, naps are even superior to coffee. So I think if you know your body well and you know your own sleep patterns well, you're much likely to be more productive. And I, I will say as well that there is a, there's an element, as you were saying that, I was thinking about a, a recent study that was done that looked at when you were saying your attention span your, your your attention span was low i was thinking you can even leverage that kind of distraction for having a particular for having a particular job in life mm-hmm. so you know for example um a study that was done recently looked at adults and children and they gave them these shapes that they had to focus on and then they had to match it with other shapes later on 
And what they found was that adults were much better at remembering how to match these things when they were asked to focus on something. But but when they were not asked to focus on something, the kids were actually superior at recollecting and at making this matching, telling us that that children, when, when their minds are not fixed on a particular thing, their minds will wander, and when their minds wander, they collect information. So when someone tells me that they have a short attention span, my first thought is not like, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> you know, part of it is like, let's figure out how you want to use that in the world, because maybe your short attention span can be used to an advantage on some kind of creative endeavor. And if we put you on a team with someone who likes being super focused, then maybe you can contribute something, they can contribute something, and together you can come up with an incredible, you can actually sort of execute on a very creative idea, uh, thereby using your, your inattentiveness to your advantage. And there have been studies that have shown that people with ADHD can be more creative as well. So I wouldn't throw that I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater there. Yeah. I mean, I noticed that, you know, uh, the one thing that it's forced me to do is, you know, when I do have the ability to focus, it's an intensity of focus that allows me to get far more done, you know, in less time than, you know, maybe somebody who doesn't have a short attention span. Yes. I mean, absolutely. Because in that in that intensity, there is. I mean, there's so much that happens, right? I mean, if you actually get down to the subtlety of what we're talking about, focus and unfocus do eventually work together. So I'm, I'm thinking about, um, you know, just think about um, writing, right? I mean, first you start, you write, and you're focusing on the idea. But the more you focus, the more you lose yourself in the idea. And the more you start to feel, when you are actually lost in that idea, is where you find that the idea comes to life. And you see this a lot in sport as well, where people like in tennis, for example, might be tight initially because they're focusing and they're over-focusing. But then they focus just enough to be able to get lost in the game and all of a sudden they're not tight anymore. So I think that, that the, one of the things about writing this book and unfocus is that it's sort of artificial to separate out focus and unfocus because I think one feeds the other. That out of an incredibly unfocused time, you know, for example, you could have a brainstorming session, you can then have a convergent time where you're like, okay, let's pull our thoughts together. Or out of a very focused time, like playing music for a long period of time, or really concentrating on writing, you can lose yourself in that moment of focus and and explore an entirely unfocused world. I think you speak to any meditator about this. And, and any meditator would attest to the fact that even when you have your mind focused on your breath, it starts off as a focused meditation, but then your state of consciousness changes and you start to feel like you're in a more unfocused universe. So I think that the real complexity about focus and unfocus is that they work together. And by over-focusing, which is really the point of this book, you deny yourself a lot of your own uh, your intrinsic intelligence. Mm. So I have to ask, uh, what is the role of technology and devices um, in all of this? Like, do you know? I mean, I seem to keep coming across a pattern that we really need time away from this stuff. And I, I'm curious what your own research is showing about this. So I think there's two things here. Uh, probably one of the things that most intrigues me about this is that uh, you know, the more you look at the marketplace and you realize, you know, all of these things about robots taking over our jobs, there is some truth to it. I mean, when I look, when I last look at the robot literature, I saw things like there were there were robots that were delivering food um, on Yelp. There were robots that were acting as hotel bellhops. There were robots that were actually doing sports writing for some TV stations. And you know, there were robots that were doing some pretty. There were robots that were making health food. So I was thinking, what what is going on? And I think what's going on is that there's some kind of commoditization of linear intelligence, that the more we're able to program, the more we are able to develop machines that can replace more linear thinking. And so to me, one of the big opportunities here with Unfocus is to activate this Unfocus circuit, this DMN, learn all these different ways to basically promote brain plasticity and change so that we become the masters of the human universe. Like robots will almost definitely be better than we are at number crunching and at linear processes. But I think humans are really good at being human. We've just lost the time and inclination to do that. 
So I, I really believe that these unfocused techniques are particularly important because as we, as we seek to be relevant in a world that is getting taken over by machines and robots, these unfocused techniques will place us at an advantage. Wow. The second thing, which I think relates to this idea of, of digital distraction, you know, I mean, aren't we a little bit too distracted? Absolutely. I think that what, what I think that, that what technology does is it gets us absorbed in a kind of hamster wheel kind of pattern. Like I notice this in, my, in myself sometimes, where I'll be checking email. And it's a purely addictive phenomenon. You know, it's a little like playing Russian roulette. But you're like, okay, bad email, bad email. <laughs> and suddenly it's like one good email. And it's like, oh, my God, I can't stop going through the emails because you just want to find one good email every time you go back. Yeah. And so I feel like this kind of habitual uh, behavior is, is not helpful. It actually it's, it's, it is like an addiction. And you can really get addicted to this and your mind can get caught in what I call habit hell. So I think that, that learning to unplug can be really protective to our brains. And, and I think, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. Like, you know, I, I, for example, at this stage of my life, I don't think there's any way I could go somewhere where there's like zero access to email. <laughs> like, 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 you know, some of my friends would be like, oh, we had such a great long weekend. We went off to somewhere in upstate New York. And the great thing was that there was no TV and no, like, I think I would be just completely, I would be an anxious wreck. Like, I think, because <laughs> I'd have to be thinking about what I was coming back to. Uh-huh. But I but I think, you know, you can find what's right for you. I think if you say to yourself, okay, I'm overdoing it with the email checking, I'm overdoing it with the multitasking, let me try to figure out how I can how I can do this differently. Like sometimes I'll just realize that I don't turn my notifications off. And so if I'm talking to someone, you know, on the right hand screen on my computer, I, I keep on seeing these emails. And and it, sometimes you see these subject lines and they make you feel sick to your stomach. And you're talking to someone and you're like, oh my God, like, I'm, I'm, this is, I'm being such a mixed emotion experience. And so I just turn the notifications off. So I think that, that without a doubt, uh, I, I think that digital distraction is real. I think that there are studies coming out now that show that it's not all bad, that actually there's something about this fast evolution of technology that's also stimulating creativity. So people looking for images on Facebook or to put on Twitter or trying to make Insta stories, that that these are that there are also creative moments associated with this. My sense is we need to be active and dynamic in evaluating our relationship with social media. And I think as long as we stay connected to our core and we realize that we are leading this this whole engagement, we will feel better. But if we start feeling like social media is pulling us off or that our email is pulling us off, then we're going to start to feel out of control. And I think that that kind of loss of control can lead to burnout. So like everything, I, the most things that I believe, I believe there are pros and cons to technology. I think the biggest opportunity is in developing the, the ultimate human brain, because I think that the default mode network is going to be much more difficult to replicate in robots than you know our linear cortical processing centers. Um, but I also think that 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 the other piece of this, which is unrelated, is the way we interact with our technology needs to be on our terms and not having this technology control our lives. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, you know, I want to ask you, you know, uh, so I'm in the process of learning a new skill, which is to how to play the guitar, which I, I literally bought yesterday. And as I, you know, like I started just playing chords and looking at YouTube videos and it got me thinking, you know, when I knew I was talking to you this morning, I, I wanted to ask, OK, how could I take the ideas from this book and the ideas that you've researched? And how could I apply that to the skill of learning something like learning how to play the guitar? You know, and I'm not trying to become, you know, John Mayer, but just to the point where I could play a few pop songs fairly easily and you know amuse myself so that's a that's that's an interesting set of thoughts that you just expressed so firstly i mean maybe you could be better than john Mayer. <laughs> <laughs> and the the concept that that we that, I, that we talk about here is um is self-handicapping versus uh and then there's another set of ideas called self-esteem uh, maintenance versus self-esteem optimization so self-handicapping is where we lower the bar because we don't want to be disappointed. Now, while at some level, it's, it, it may be it's true because of the amount of time you would give to the guitar, you may not reach the level of proficiency of John Mayer. It's also true that it, if you actually allowed yourself to engage a more freakish side of you, you, you may actually suddenly surprise yourself. Mm-hmm. So 
is it possible? Is it likely? No. <laughs> is it possible? Sure. Yeah. You know, so if it's possible, why handicap yourself with something lower? I think a good example of this is I actually, I, I sort of fool around with my trainer about this. I always tell him, okay, you know, we're going for the five rings, like Olympics. And, you know, he laughs and he's like, come on. You know, I mean, I, I like to try to be physically fit, but like the Olympics is not, it's probably even further, less likely than you are being like John Mayer. <laughs> So he looked at me and I said, you know what? I don't like setting low goals. Like, I, and I don't mind if I don't reach these goals. Yeah. But if I don't have like some amazing goal, then like, what's the point? Like, the, the only reason to have a, a lower goal is to not be disappointed. And all that a higher goal can do is inspire you to reach it. So as long as I'm aware of not wanting to hurt myself and I don't push myself beyond a particular point, why not have that higher goal? So that would be number one. I think... Number two, which is an interesting thing related to self-handicapping, is that we, we live our, li- our lives in the self-esteem maintenance mode. We do whatever we need to do to keep, up, to keep our lives sort of you know, level. But self-esteem optimization, which is SEO for humans, is actually a, a state in which you can say, you know what, I want to play incredibly well. Now, let's go back to the essence of your question, which is what can I use of these techniques that can help me do this? Well, the first is possibility thinking, right? The possibility thinking would be, is it possible for me to play better than anyone's ever played with my circumstances? Yes, because maybe you're not John Mayer, but in the range of people who can play like you, maybe there is something that you can do. You know, I think the second thing is, is reframing and, and refocusing. So the reframing would be, it's not about whether I wanna play like John Mayer or not, it's about trying to see whatever your goal is. If your goal is to learn two songs in six months, then you'll learn two songs in six months. If your goal is to get better and better over time and you want to do something in six months and then double that in the next three months and then triple that in the next three months, then you can reframe that like that. So the John Mayer idea may turn, you, turn your brain off completely because your brain's like, whatever, mm-hmm. you're not John Mayer, it's never going to happen. You don't practice as much. But if you said to your brain, what that is symbolic of is, I want to get better, using that kind of reframe can be really helpful. The third thing I think relates to maybe the essence of what you're asking, which is, how do you get into some kind of creative flow? And I think that's a really beautiful example of both focus and unfocused working together. So I'm I'm a trained musician, and I, you know, I, I came from a very classical tradition. So I learned, you know, I learned the hard way, meaning... Uh, and and it's interesting because in, in the UK, for example, there's a – so South Africa where I'm from sort of has a, a technique that's similar to the UK, which is you learn all the painful scales first. And once you've done all of that, you can start to improvise. But there are teaching methods in America, which I think are pretty awesome, which are like, no, let's just start with the piece. And somebody who's more traditional would be like, that's impossible. First, you've got to learn the basics. But a lot of people who use this, this more American method have actually found that that's not necessary. You can indirectly learn the scales as you're learning how to play pieces. So I wouldn't limit that experience. I would say the idea is just to play. But I would invite you to try one particular thing, actually. I would say, uh, in, so first learn the stuff very rigidly the way you would ordinarily learn. And then I would ask you to just play anything. Just like allow your fingers to move however they want to move. And you will notice that it's actually harder to be random than you think. Your brain will go back to things that you knew. And we actually know this. Like I've done this, I play the piano. And so when I I, I have improvisation lessons, which is sort of like a, sounds like a contradiction. But when I, I would say, okay, I just want to improvise for five minutes. Let me think of a pattern around which I'm going to improvise. It's, It's actually very difficult to escape that pattern. And to be completely mad. So I think to learn more of the skill, you want to play around with surrender. I mean, if you look at Jimi Hendrix, for example, and you look at how Hendrix plays, it's pretty hard to imagine that that comes just from working hard. Right? I mean, there's some other quality of surrender that occurs when you play the guitar in that way. Like there's something where you've learned the technical skills, but you're not afraid to let your mind go. And so I think you should use the guitar to explore what it's like to let your mind go. And I have a concrete example of that, actually. I, I decided in this last year, I, I was playing piano with my piano teacher, and all of a sudden I was like, 
this is so painful because I trained at music and I used to play really well and I didn't feel like I had that competency. Even though I switched to jazz, I was like, this is still not good enough. And then I thought, I want to be in some state that doesn't require that degree of talent. And so I got up from the piano stool and then I said, you know what, I want to sing. And, and he said, well, what do you want to sing? I said, I don't know. He said, well, do you have any idea? I said, no, I have no idea, but we're going to start now and I want you to play anything. And I, I just started singing and he just started playing. And over three months, I actually had enough songs that I thought, why don't I write a musical? And I'm going to just use the next year and a half to go back to those songs. And what that taught me was that it wasn't about being brilliant. It wasn't about just knowing every single piece of music. It was about trusting that within every one of us, there is some kind of idea, some kind of competency that wants to come out, and that music is a way of translating that. So why not have a more open and exploratory attitude to that, the exactly the same kind of attitude as you would have inquiring about someone's job choices, instead of being sort of too tense and too taut and preventing this fast progress. So my, my, my general feeling is if you move between focus and unfocus, learning the focus stuff of the piece, but making sure you set aside at least one or two times a week where you go a little crazy or maybe you sing on top of what you're playing and you just you just see what happens. Like when I did this musical thing, I actually said to my teacher, I just want to confront the ugly parts of my voice and I just want to hear them come out and see what happens. And that was kind of amazing to do that because you learn so much about yourself just by being curious and not holding yourself to some level of perfection. I always feel like excellence comes out when you explore and discover, and then you can repeat an originally learned pattern by yourself, as opposed to just following instruction, which makes it very difficult to liberate yourself to the state of excellence. Wow. Um, well, this has been mind-blowing and profound, as I as I expected it would be. Uh, so I have one last question, which I know you've heard me ask since I've asked it to you before. It'd be interesting to see how you answer it uh, six months later. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? I, I think to be unmistakable means that you are in possession of of something that is original. And I think that probably the most amazing quality that exists in every human being is the capacity to change. And so I think what makes you unmistakable is when you have a, a fearless inclination to explore the next level of your own existence and where you use yourself as a barometer for that change so that you can feel your own evolution. Wow. Um, well, this has been amazing. Uh, where can people learn more about the book uh, and and your work. Um, so my so my the book and work are, are, are both on my website, which is drsrinipillay dot com d r s r i n i p i l l a y dot com, and the book Tinker Dabble Doodle Try, Unlock the Power of the Unfocused Mind can be found on any, um, on any major uh, seller of books, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and on my website there's a whole list of places where the book is being sold, and I really hope that people will join this. What, what I hope will be some kind of resurgence of, of curiosity and ingenuity and, um, and a tinker revolution. I mean, I'd, I'd really love to see that in education, and I'd love to see that in the workplace, and I would love to see that in the ways in which people construct meaning in their lives. Well, I think that makes a fitting end to our conversation. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Did you know that every Sunday, our community manager, Milena, sends out 10 key takeaways from episodes just like this one? All you have to do to receive it is sign up for our newsletter. Just visit unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter, and you'll get them delivered right to your inbox. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter. With Candy Crush Saga, the crush is real. For the first time ever, we're celebrating real crushers and their stories inside the game. Find out why they love playing, complete levels inspired by them, and win rewards they chose for you. For a limited time only, see why the crush is very real with Candy Crush Saga. Download now from the App Store or Google Play for free. Ends May 27th. Available to selected players level 25 and over.